Do good for your own self. Do it because God wants you to be happy. When you come to church, when you worship him, you're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself because that's what makes God happy. Amen? <laughs> Throughout the history of Christianity, significant importance has been placed on Christians coming together to worship God and cultivate a community. Church is not some service we have to attend in order to be counted as a good Christian, but rather an institute vitally important to both our own faith and Christianity as a whole. Biblical verses illustrate the necessity of Christians coming together, such as Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. It is the means by which God is worshiped, community is formed, discipleship and accountability are strengthened, belief is grown, and the people of God are equipped to bring the word to an unbelieving world. However, we are now witnessing the fruits of a new trend in church structure, the mega church. Over the past few decades, mega churches have become increasingly popular and are now displacing smaller churches in their wake. But I ask you, can the mega church goal of becoming relatable to modern culture do more harm than good? My opening quote was pulled from a sermon by Victoria Osteen at Lakewood, the largest church in America. Is such an oversimplified, self-serving message more effective at reaching people? And is this what we want modern Christianity to become? To begin, a mega church can be defined as a congregation which has 2,000 or more worship attenders in one week and whose roots typically lie in evangelical beliefs. Certain qualities such as rapid growth over a short period of time, uniquely gifted senior pastor, and music industry quality worship distinguish these mega churches beyond their sheer size. Unlike many earlier churches, the mega church houses a myriad of ministries that appeals to all people and activities making them self-sustaining and self-contained. One of the largest distinguishing qualities of these churches is their drive to attract the unchurch. Mega church services are geared to refashion earlier church traditions to be, more, to be made more relevant and acceptable to the modern unbeliever. However, this goal demonstrates the origin of the problem. These churches seek to appear no different than the surrounding culture in order to cater to the unchurched. While some may argue that mega churches are beneficial to the Christian community, others suggest that this model of church may undermine spiritual growth. Mega churches are becoming like the culture they should be seeking to transform. For their extensive focus on reaching the unchurched has led them to over-prioritize entertainment and self-serving desires rather than God. The mega church does not achieve the evangelism it is targeting for its lack of discipleship fails to cultivate Christians of a deeper faith, and its structure inherently creates flawed, flawed roles for both church members and leadership. For these reasons, the mega church's apparent growth in numbers masks this model's weakness in growing mature members of the faith, thereby hampering rather than helping advance the kingdom for God. The mega church is made for the unchurched. Their goal is to reach society's unbelievers, usher them into a church they can finally enjoy and understand, and ultimately bring these people to the faith. But is this how church is best structured? Mega churches are distinguished by their huge auditoriums, inviting faces, well-performed worship, engaging preacher, breathtaking facilities, all focused on making people feel welcomed and excited to be there. These churches direct almost all of their energy into attracting as many people as they can. However, this model of church focuses on ways to entertain the numbers so they can be there regardless of their faith. Rather than celebrating the goodness and glory of God or teaching members how and why to live well, these churches are appealing to the audience's satisfaction and desire. In this way, they are hurting rather than helping their many thousands of members. Seeker-sensitive churches, like the mega church, are more likely to produce members who profess Christ with their mouth, but live like the world they are called to transform. And what led them down this path? The church itself. The church, in response to the individualism widely present throughout society, refocus on meeting the desires of the people, catering to the wishes, and offering its attendees support rather than salvation, help rather than holiness. Now, 
Is every single attendee of a mega church shallow or a consumer of Christianity? Of course not, for there are plenty of strong and faithful Christians who attend these churches, frequently as a ministry to others. However, on the whole, it seems that this mega church model too easily promotes the engagement of the senses rather than the mind and soul, a place where a Christian can remain completely anonymous, never using his gifts to serve the church or receive discipleship on how to live in the world without becoming worldly. By focusing on the newest attraction or most entertaining services, the church becomes an agent of personal fulfillment rather than a place of salvation and discipleship. Services are made for the visitor, placing their comfort and opinions over the worship of God. As Alan Wolf quotes in The Transformation of American Religion, in the long run, it creates a monotonic, downsized faith, a faith too naive and sam simple to handle complexity, too repetitive to deal with real change. With these mega churches, we see people become consumers of Christian ideas wrapped in a worldly package rather than authentic believers of Christ. This has resulted in the percentage of regular participant worship in mega churches dropping 14% in the last 10 years. And the percentage of members that think their mega church is spiritually vital has also dropped 14% in 10 years. However, the author of Hebrews 5:12 through 6:1 argues that our faith is not meant to remain infantile, but to grow for our good and God's glory. The author writes that everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he's a child, but solid food is for the mature. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. While megachurch teachings are not necessarily false, they do not provide Christians the solid food necessary to live a truly Christian life. Repeating the same message, which at its best is rooted in the gospel story, but worse in entertaining the audience, does not further grow Christians or give them the solid food they need. In this way, they are hurting their members, and they create a seeker sense. Oh, my bad. They create a spectator-like faith rather than a body of fully devoted believers. A final critique of the megachurch deals with the inherent flaws that arise from the structure of this model. One of the largest problems of the megachurch is their need for and growth of a celebrity pastor, a larger-than-life persona that fits with the world fascination with fame. This structure creates a dangerous um, structure for both its members and leaders, as it, for there's only increased temptation for the senior pastor to become enslaved by the power and pride surrounding him, as many cases demonstrate. The church re-shifts its focus to one man rather than the body as a whole community, therefore making it very difficult for these mega churches to thrive without its celebrity pastor. The Mars Hill Mega Church demonstrates the fault with this structure, as its consolidated power, business inspired plans, celebrity leadership, and strong efforts to become bigger led to head pastor Mark Driscoll greatly abusing his power in the church with arrogance, harsh leadership, and misuse of money. In the end, Driscoll was forced to resign from his position, and in a short period of time, a huge mega church was disbanded, with thousands of members displaced purely based on one man's fault. Now, some would argue that megachurches are beneficial since they create a unique and inviting atmosphere. And as author Stephen Mattson writes, in order to create community, they devote tons of time, energy, and resources into, genu into generating genuine ways for this community to happen. While megachurches undoubtedly have the ability to do more than a smaller church, a measurement of the impact per person may result in a very different perspective. An intensive study done by the National Congregation Study found that a church of 100 members gives roughly 53% more per capita than a church of 2,000 members. And another study by Duke University found that the larger the um, church, the smaller the probability of attendance. Mega churches are measuring the success by how much the church claims rather than how much individuals are actively using their gifts for the church. Additionally, members at a megachurch can remain anonymous because of the huge size, never creating personal relationships with the people in the church, and therefore remain uncompelled to grow his faith beyond the Sunday service. In conclusion, 
Mega churches both epitomize and add to the decline of Christianity today. But moving beyond the theoretical debates, I personally have witnessed the weaknesses and failures of this mega church model. I grew up in a church that encouraged personal relationships, intimate discipleship, authenticity with grace and truth. A church where every member was engaged, needed, and definitely not a spectator. But over time, this church, my home church, became increasingly enamored with growing facilities rather than with growing people, with becoming a celebrity rather than a shepherd. I saw biblical learning, discipleship, and personal relationships greatly diminished within the span of a few years, with many, many lives hurt in the process. So what can we do to reverse this tide of a weakened church? We can encourage both ourselves and our Christian brethren to place spiritual learning over seeker sensitivity, to become more of a participant than a spectator, to transform culture rather than mimic it, and we can therefore restore our church to its historical place as a salt and light for the earth. Thank you.